welcome everyone for this Monash Cybersecurity Seminar. Today, we are delighted to welcome Rafael Dosti from Monash University. Uh, Rafael is a lecturer in the Department of Software Systems and Cybersecurity at Monash University. His, focus, his research focuses on cryptography and its abundant intersections with fields such as machine learning, security, privacy, and information theory. And he, is, he has a key interest on the design of crypt on design of cryptographic protocols to enhance privacy and some of his current investigators are into privacy regarding machine learning, cryptocurrencies and blockchain technologies. And Rafael will play talk about uh, TARDIS, a foundation of uh, the time of puzzles in UC. Over here. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. Uh, just Can you guys see my screen? Yeah, all good, thank you. Good. Okay, so I'll be talking today about this paper called TARGES, a foundation of time lock puzzles in UC, the Universal Composability Framework. Uh, this is a joint paper of Carsten Bau from Aarhus University, Bernardo Davi from IT University in Copenhagen, uh, Jesper Booz Nielsen from Aarhus University and the Concordium Blockchain Research Center Aarhus, and Sabine Oxner from Aarhus University as well. And this will appear at Eurocrypt later this year, but it's already available on the IACR print server. Uh, well, wait. What is this? Oh, no, okay, now it works. So, uh, but I'll be presenting some follow-up results from another paper called Craft, Composable Randomness Beacons on Output Independent Abort MPC from Time. Because the papers are quite related. Uh, the, the second paper is essentially a follow-up of the first one. It's also available on ASR at print server, and uh, it's on the submission nowadays. It's the same quarters. So let me first introduce introduce the problem. Uh, so uh, we will be looking at time lock puzzles. They essentially allow you to encrypt a message to the future. So you generate a time lock puzzle containing a message X, for instance, that can be opened after some time. You put like in a safe box, and then when an off time uh, has passed, you can open the safe box. Let's say that's the physical way it would look like. If, but of course we are doing a digital protocol for that. And then you can obtain the message X from the time lock puzzle. So essentially for constructing and modeling a time lock puzzle, we need a computational task that must be executed in sequential steps, take at least some time. It's, it needs to be a, a task that you cannot parallelize. Because if you can parallelize, then you cannot guarantee this time, uh, this lower bound of the time that it will be needed uh, to open the message. You need some task that you really need to do one step after the other. And the first example of a time lock puzzle was introduced by Ronald Rives, uh, Ad Shami, and uh, David Wagner in 96, and uh, their first construction was based on the hardness of iterated square of elements of groups with unknown order, like uh, RSA group, for instance. So what is the idea in the construction? So they have this iterated square in time lock assumption, which essentially says that if you pick like P and Q, as you do when you generate a RSA key, and then you make n uh, equals to p times q, and then you you consider the group of the primitive residuals modulo n, like you would do in RSA. And now, if you pick a random element of this group and you try to compute g to the power of two to t, where t is the minimum amount of time that you want to uh, anyone to spend to open the, I mean, it's not the amount of time, it's the number of sequential steps that you need, you'd like everyone to need to do. So if you want to compute g to the power of 2 to t, 
this would take as much time as you take to do t sequential squaring. It's like you compute from g, you compute g squared, then you compute g to the two to the two, g to the two to the three, and so on, until you get the final result. And uh, I mean, this assumption essentially says that you cannot parallelize this, uh, this computation if you don't know the order of the group, which is essentially the case in RSA kind of group. So if you want to encrypt a message M using this kind of time lock puzzle, you can instruct the message after T steps by compute, you essentially compute the TLP as being G, the random element that you choose. And then the second part of it is the message multiplied by G to the lowercase T here, where lowercase T is two to the power of T, the uppercase T, Modulo the Euler tautate function, which is p minus one uh, times q minus one, like the, the function that you always use together with RSA groups. So if you, if you do these computations, I mean you compute all the steps, then you can recover the message. Essentially, if you do all the squares, then uh, you recover the last element in the sequence up here. And you can uh, compute the inverse of it just to recover the original message. But essentially, you're assuming that you cannot recover this message faster than uh, doing the sequential computation. So, just time based primitives uh, have gained a lot of attention uh, in the last few years. Uh, things like time lock puzzles or verifiable delay functions, because they are seen as quite powerful building blocks for cryptographic protocol, like randomness becomes partially fair, secure computation, fair auctions, and so on. Especially in the blockchain space, uh, there is a lot of people propose constructions based on time-based primitives. <coughs> but applications normally use uh, time lock puzzles on VDFs uh, in a composed way. They are concurrently composed with other cryptographic primitives and other sub-protocols. And actually you consider the security in complex scenarios such as a blockchain setting, which is widely distributed and uh, co So. But the problem is that uh, the, the constructions that we know for TLPs and the VDFs do not offer this kind of general composability guarantees. So essentially, you have constructions where you analyze the security of a time lock puzzle or VDF completely isolated from the world. It can be like game-based definitions or simulation-based definitions, but you, you consider that this thing is completely isolated from the world and it don't interact with the outside world. But now if you plug this thing inside uh, the real world, then uh, your, essentially your security analysis is null. I mean, because you, you haven't analyzed the protocol in this, in this kind of uh, situation. So you cannot easily plug in this, this constructions that you have in uh, bigger applications and just guarantee that it's secure. So a uh, consequence of that is that the security claims of many applications that people are proposing in the last few years using time lock puzzles or VDFs, they are often shake or, or even wrong since these primitives are used on the composition. So, so now we want to analyze time lock puzzles in the global, the universal composability framework, more specifically in the global version of it which is essentially a framework that once you prove the security in this framework, then you can arbitrarily compose the protocol as a sub protocol of other big protocols. Or you can consider this protocol interact with arbitrary other protocols in the internet or whatever is happening. So it's essentially based on the simulation paradigm that we often use in cryptography that go back to the 80s from the zero knowledge proofs and so on. But now you don't have just like, I mean, this, in the traditional simulation paradigm, you have a protocol and then uh, you have an adversary that's trying to attack in this protocol, right? And the adversary controls some of the parts. It, and this is the real world scenario. 
And the ideal world scenario, you have an ideal functionality that just get the inputs, give the outputs, and uh, everything is done magically, and uh, you don't have to worry about anything. And now you have, for every adversary that you have in the real world, you have to develop a simulator in the ideal world that, that you cannot distinguish both of them, the outputs that are given by both of them. But these outputs are only analyzed after the simulation is done or after the real world execution is done. But I mean, essentially, this ignores the fact that uh, when you analyze the protocol, maybe it's interact with other things than in the external world. So in the UC framework, essentially, what you do is you introduce an environment, which is here represented by Z in this picture. I mean, and the environment essentially captures all the activities that happen that are external to the protocol instance. So you analyze the security of one protocol instance, and uh, there are a lot of things happening outside. Maybe other instances of the same protocol, maybe other instances of different protocols, maybe all these things together. You don't know. You, you want to analyze the security of one specific instance of one protocol, but then there is this environment that models everything that is outside, but still can interact with your instance that you're analyzing. So now, but now uh, the environment, it's not like just a distingu distinguisher that uh, gets the outputs and uh, try to check if it is in the real or ideal world. But in fact, it can interact with uh, the adversary of the simulator at any time. So it's connected to the adversary of the simulator all the time. So essentially you cannot do like hair winding kind of techniques in the proof. The simulation needs to be straight line. I mean, you, you cannot like do, oh, my simulator just execute the adversary and uh, if I don't get the, the outcome that I want, I just hair wind the adversary to the beginning and execute everything again. No, the, the, the environment is connected to your adversary. So it will know that you hair wind it. And the important thing here is that, uh, that the so-called UC composition theorem that says that if, if you prove that uh, a protocol is secure in the UC framework, the protocol remains secure even if you execute a parallel uh, concurrent executions of many different protocols. So this makes your life much easier to design like uh, protocols in a modular way. And also it guarantees that your protocol keeps it secure when uh, you actually execute it in a real life scenario where it will not be isolated from the external world. So if, if you have any questions, please stop me at any time and just ask. Rafael. Yeah. Uh, so I'm new to this UC framework, right? Uh, yeah. So just in terms of the environment, uh, by saying that it captures all activities, does this also um, cover things like set channels and so on? Um, yeah. Or do you have to, I mean, I suppose that at least you need to assume something about the confidentiality of the local secret. I mean, so, so you, you assume like, okay, so let me explain this protocol, this picture in more detail. So you have the, the environment here, right? And the, in the real world here, you have Pi, which models the protocol execution. This will be actually, it's a simplified picture, but it will essentially be many parts that communicate between themselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, they'll have to, they'll need channels between themselves and so on. So, and uh, you have to make some assumptions on the channels, right? So mm -hmm. if you assume that the channels are secure, then uh, you have one kind of guarantee. If you assume that the channels are only, you just have the channels, but they are not secure, then it's another kind of guarantee. But, uh, I mean, normally when you are designing like more complicated protocols, you're normally assuming that the channels between the parts are secure and authenticated. I mean, I see. It, that use uh, encryption authentication. I mean, of, co of course, if you, your deployment scenario is different, then you need to change your communication model. And now, now essentially in the, so essentially the strategy that all the simulators in UC is normally do is the following, like it runs the internal corp of the adversary. As you can see here in the ideal world, there is an internal corp of A there. And the simulator needs to do 
and a simulation of the complete uh, protocol execution internally for the adversary so that the adversary cannot distinguish if this is being done inside the simulator or not. And uh, the environment is being connected here. And, uh, and uh, of course, you have the ideal functionality F here, which models, okay, if your functionality is designed to do such thing, the ideal functionality does it perfectly, just get the inputs, give the outputs to the parts, and uh, you're, you're good to go. So you need to get a simulator that can, that the guarantee should be that for all, uh, for all like polynomial probabilistic time, probabilistic polynomial time environment, and for all adversaries, you should have a simulator such that the environment cannot distinguish the real and ideal world. And when we say that uh, the global universal composability framework, it's when you normally have some uh, global functionality that can help you both in the ideal and the real world. And uh, they are globally available, so the simulator cannot control it. In this case, uh, we will use, for instance, the global random oracle model. So you assume that you have a global random oracle, which is not controlled by the simulator. And uh, the simulator cannot like restart the random oracle on this kind of things. And uh, it's visible for everyone, for the environment for everyone. Uh, so that's why I put it here just so that's the difference between the universal composability framework and the global one. I see. It. Thank you. I mean, I'm, I'm just trying to give a high level overview because I mean, the, the technical details of uh, UCF takes quite some time to understand the technical details. And, but, but essentially, like, the thing is, like, even if you don't like what you see, essentially all the frameworks that we have, we know nowadays that guarantee some kind of uh, arbitrary composition uh, while keep a secret, they are, they are essentially equivalent to you see in some, in some way. There are other frameworks, uh, but they're essentially all equivalent and the UC is the most uh, used one by far. So that's why I focus on it. <coughs> Sorry. So, Okay, okay, but so the way uh, the universal composability framework uh, is works in a formal way, it's inherently asynchronous and has no notion of time. Because uh, when you compare the both words, it goes in the following, like there is only, I mean, among all the parts that execute the protocol, the adversary, the environment and so on, there is only one entity that's activated at each time. And then uh, it can do some steps that it wants to do, and then it pass the activation to the next part and so on. So that, that is no notion of synchrony or anything. And that is no notion of time in the UC framework, uh, the standard model. And uh, I mean, and in the case of uh, time lock poses, if it, if we had a notion of time, how would we enforce this equation computation? Because, so imagine an environment that have, uh, so it tries to run many sessions of the time lock puzzle, and it wants to compute the solution of the time lock puzzle, and then for the first session, it just gives like G and uh, gets G square, but at the same time for the second one, it, it's giving like G square and getting the answer for that. I mean, it opens T sessions and send one query to each session. So that, there is no way you can, uh, I mean, there is no trivial way that you can somehow restrict the computation of uh, the environment to be sequential in this plain UC model. Because the simulator can have many sessions running in parallel. So our contributions, what are we going to do? So first we need to get an abstract model for time in UC. So that we can actually analyze these time-based primitives. Then we do a UC treatment of uh, publicly verifiable time lock puzzles. Uh, we prove that actually, if you want to get UC secure time lock puzzles, you need a programmable head oracle function. Then we develop this new notion of MPC secure multipath computation with output independent abort. I will explain the details later on. And uh, we can actually do 
efficient uh, guaranteed, guaranteed output delivery coin toss in which can be used for instance for randomness beacon. So as I told uh, in the standard UC model there is no notion of time but uh, of course people uh, in the past wanted to analyze synchronous protocols and so on. So that, that were, there were uh, some papers that introduced global or local clock functionalities so that they could analyze synchronous protocols. Like the, the first one was a local clock functionality by Jonathan Katz, Uli Maurer, uh, Bjorn Tuckman, and uh, Vasily Zikas in 2013. And then, uh, but I mean, this local functionality local clock it's, uh, it's not the best assumption ever because you assume that the, lock, the clock is local to every specific instance that you analyze. It's quite tricky. It's not the ideal solution. So in 2016, Neurocrypt, uh, Agilus Kiaias, uh, Zoo and uh, Zikas define a global render or global clock functionality. But essentially both of the solutions, they model like wall clocks. Uh, the parts uh, that are participating in the protocol or the ideal functionalities, they can ask for the current time. But in many cryptographic protocols, they, they are not, even the, the time sensitive protocols, they are not uh, necessarily worried about the exact time. They are more like they need, what they normally need is that some events happen in a certain order. They, they need some computations to finish before some mes message arrives or vice versa. So they, they, they have like a, an order that the events should uh, happen, but uh, not necessarily like the precise times. So, and uh, I mean, one problem with this kind of uh, both local and global clock functionality is that kinds of synchronize the, the, the parts because they, they can query the time and uh, know exactly where they are. So you cannot get like same synchronous kind of uh, solutions very easily. Like if you want to do, for instance, in blockchain setting like Ouroboros kind of protocols that are same synchronous, uh, you cannot analyze them very neatly using these clock functionalities. So another related work, uh, of course, you have the standalone uh, malleable time lock puzzles by Hivest et al. that I mentioned before. They are based on iterated squaring. You also have uh, verifiable delay functions based on iterated squaring by Veselovsk in Eurocrypt 2019. I mean, there are other constructions of uh, time lock puzzles and uh, VDFs, but these are the most relevant for our work. And now, uh, very recently, last year, there were some constructions of non-malleable time lock puzzles, which is a stronger notion than uh, the standalone ones. There was uh, one work by Katz, uh, Jonathan Katz, and some co-authors that appeared in TCC uh, last year. And uh, then there is a work by Efrain et al. that uh, I think is under submission still. I mean, and they propose like no malleable time lock poses, both of them. But I mean, no malleability, it's strictly weaker than UC. Yeah, so you, UC security implies no malleability. And uh, so, so they do not have composability guarantees, but they can be constructed, both of them, they can be constructed without needing a programmable random oracle because we proved that uh, programmable random oracles are needed if you want to do like UC secure time lock puzzles. So the work by cuts at all, they require uh, no random oracles at all. They just require a common reference string. And the work by Efrain at all requires an uh, observable random oracle. You cannot program the random oracle, but you can observe the queries. And uh, the work by Katz uh, is based on iterated squaring as well, like as we're going to do our protocol. But the one by Efren at all builds on the generic time lock puzzles and uh, verifiable delay functions. <coughs> so, what is this abstract world composable time 
notion that we come up with. So we have no more global clock. It's, uh, instead of it, we have a global ticket telling only the functionality that the time has passed, but not how much time. So you, you have, so you have a, a ticker that uh, any functionality can know when a new tick happens, but uh, the parts that are running the protocol, they cannot know that. See, so you, ha you have this global ticker and if the functionality asks, okay, I'm, I want to know if a tick can happen or not. Then you get an answer. Yes, the tick can happen or not. But the parts, what they can do is they're falling. Like they can tell the, the ticket that they have been activated in, in that specific tick, but they'll get no answer. The only thing is that we need, I mean, we need to allow all the parts to do some, uh, some computation or receive messages during the tick. So we need all the parts to be activated during one tick. The parts can be activated and they can tell the global tick, I have been activated. If you want to advance to the next step, you can do it, but uh, it don't know how much time it has passed or anything like that. Uh, Rafael, so yeah. previously you mentioned that the communication is naturally asynchronous and there is no way to enforce the sequential or the ordering of the message, right? In, in, the, in the plane you see, yes, there is no notion of time. So. Mm -hmm. And, and I mean, you analyze, you analyze the protocols by just like, okay, every single part is activated once. So you, let's say that uh, Alice is activated now and then she sends a message. And uh, if the network is, is, the scheduling of the network is controlled by the adversary, she passed the activation to the adversary. And then the adversary can, uh, can contact the environment and pass the activation to him or he can deliver the message and, uh, to Bob and uh, pass the activation to Bob and so on. So that, there is no notion of uh, time. Uh, right, and here for, for the query to the um, global ticket, uh, tick here, um, is there any assumption in terms of the ordering of the message here? For example, if you send two uh, ticket queries in sequence, then for, for the receive the response, is there any ordering or? So, so essentially like uh, the, the ticks will be under control of the environment. The environment can control the ticks, but the environment needs to give the chance to all the parts to do some stuff between the ticks. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, every, every part, so essentially like if, suppose that uh, we have one tick uh, that corresponds to one sequential step in a time lock proposal, mm -hmm. right? So all the parts during that tick need to get the chance to do the competition if they want. If they just either and don't do anything during that time, uh, that's their own business, right? But uh, they, they, they get the chance, right? So that's the thing, but uh, the, the, the environment controls the chicks. And, uh, but the thing is that the paths don't get the notion of the chicks uh, directly. They can only observe the events that happen from the functionality. So they can observe, okay, some computation, finish. Or some, for instance, if I, if I ask some computation for the time lock puzzle functionality, I can know that, okay, finished. The functionality uh, told me that it finished. Or you can receive messages and so on. So you, I mean, you essentially only observe the events that are, uh, that are triggered by the, 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 the time, the, the tricks, but not the time itself. So, I mean, the advantage of that is that you can model like time dependent protocols, but uh, both like in synchronous, asynchronous or semi-synchronous uh, kind of settings. So it's essentially the parties in the uh, simulator, they, they observe the times through the, uh, the trigger the events. The, I mean, if, if some event happened then, okay, so imagine like, okay, the only event that you are uh, expecting is like uh, one message that would take like 20 ticks. Mm -hmm. You only know that 20 ticks have passed because when you receive the message, for instance. If, I mean, if you have a channel that guarantees that it will deliver the, your, the message to you exactly 20 ticks F. Then when this message arrives, you know, okay, the message arrives, so the time has passed. But in the between, you, you, you don't know. 
what happened. So if, if, if you have a channel that don't have very precise bounds, you say a channel that uh, have a minimum delay, a maximum delay, whenever the message arrives, you know, okay, I got a message from this channel, but uh, so I know that at least this amount of time has passed, that most that amount of ticks has passed, but you don't know exactly. You just observe the events. Okay. You don't observe the time itself. Mm -hmm. And I mean, this actually facilitates the analysis of uh, especially like same synchronous protocols and so on. So, uh, so essentially like the parts uh, are oblivious to the time, right? They only observe the progression of time uh, in direct of events, as I said, like arrive of message or when a computation is complete. So, and it simplifies the analysis. Many cryptographic protocols just depend on the relative order of the events, but not on the precise time. As I mentioned before, the passing of abstract time is under control of the environment, but uh, the next tick can only be start after all parts have been activated. So implicitly you're enforcing that all honest parts can act before the verse to the next tick. They, they have a chance to check if they got a message or if the computation that they ask has finished and so on. And uh, the good thing is that this notion of uh, abstract composable time is composable. And uh, I mean, we, we, we model this message transmission uh, because message transmission in real life is never instantaneous. So you have to wait some time, right? And we can model these synchronous and synchronous uh, asynchronous channels. But we change the, the mode of uh, message delivery from the push model that is normally used to the pull model from, that's used, for instance, in the constructive uh, crypto framework from Uli model. So essentially, we are preventing that if you have an interactive functionality, you are preventing that it can be used to do an implicit ch communication channel. You have to explicitly uh, provide the communication channels. It's a technical detail. Uh, so, and then you can uh, do the protocol description on the security analysis in terms of these abstract delays. But then, when you want to implement the protocols, I mean, the, the guarantee is that you, since you have this notion of abstract time and that the some events should uh, happen in some uh, order for the protocol to be secure. Then when you want to implement the, the protocol, you have a clear notion of uh, what are the concrete time-based parameters. Uh, for instance, timeouts, network delays. When network is delayed, it needs to be smaller than the timeouts that you are setting and these kind of things. And these are the, con the time constraints that are most to be respected in, uh, when you implement the protocol. So, so if you pick in TADS a model for time lock puzzles, it will be like this. So you generate the time lock puzzle with t ticks containing x. And then after t ticks happen, uh, the time lock puzzle is over. You can recover your message. And the computation uh, is taking into consideration ticks, not walk clock time. So uh, here the tick can be the time that's necessary to do one secretary step. For instance, if we are modeling like this proper that the computation is sequential. If you are modeling like uh, communication channels, then uh, the ticks can represent other stuff. Why is not working? Uh, so in the proof, uh, when you are developing a security proof, you, there is no need to care for clocks or elapsed time, but uh, you focus on the order of the events. For instance, if a uh, time lock puzzle was solved before receiving some message or after receiving some message and uh, this kind of thing. So, so how can we model like iterated squaring UC? So this ideal uh, functionality that captures the assumption that a Hivis that all have done, uh, we'll capture it in a generic model style. So instead of giving the elements of the group uh, direct to the whoever is doing the computation, you only have give handles of the, the elements to them. So you, I mean, so you don't have 
your model, try to model that uh, no part will have an advantage by know some underlying facts about the specific group. Uh, you just consider a generic group model that had just that order. And they, you can do operations on the group, uh, but only with the hands. So now the parts can ask for as many squares as they want during one tick. But they only get the result of the squares after, uh, after the next tick. So, and uh, this is a global function, not meaning that uh, the environment and the simulator don't have any special power uh, for doing faster computation and so on. And uh, time lock puzzles uh, based on cyclic groups, they, uh, if they don't explore like any particular property of the underlying group, they cannot be constructed if uh, the order of the group is known. Uh, that's a result by Houghton et al. in Eurocrypt last year. So somehow uh, we have to model this way we are doing. Uh, it's from this result for Eurocrypt last year, it's pretty much what we can do. So, so suppose you, you are in tick A. So you have a bunch of elements here uh, that are stored inside. And you have, uh, you can ask for some operations. You can ask for get a random element. You can ask to square one element that you have the handle for this element, or you can get the result. So, so instance, if you ask for a random element, then uh, the function will just generate a new random element and give you the random of this element. So you can, uh, whenever you want to do a computation on this element, you just give this random to the, functionality and uh, it will know which element you mean by it. So these handles are just uh, handle strings. So if you want to square some element, you give it to the functionality and then uh, the functionality will internally compute the square of it, but it will keep it internally. It will only deliver the result to you in the next tick. So it just say to you, Computation is done. Whenever the next tick is done, uh, you can come and get the result. And uh, when you activate the get results, then you get all the results that were already there before the tick start. All the G, G1, to GK that you have here. And then whenever there is a new tick, you can uh, ask for the new results. So you had asked for the G square, then uh, now you can get the G square. So essentially, you only get the handles for the element that you need to the, for the next step of the computation once a trick pass. So you cannot ask, you cannot even create like parallel instance of this time lock puzzle assumption and uh, keep asking one element per instance because I mean you don't have the handle to ask for that question. But that is always I mean the time lock puzzle. Uh, I mean that's one difference between time lock puzzles and uh, verifiable delay functions is that time lock puzzles, they have a own, who knows the trapdoor of the RSA group. And if you know the trapdoor, then you can do arbitrary operations in essentially no time because you, you, you know the, the total function of uh, the group order, so you can do whatever you want essentially. And any part that, if you give this trapdoor to any part, then that part will also be able to do uh, the operations very fast. And uh, that can be used for the public verifiability of the time lock puzzle, which if you look at the papers, it's not proven in the TARDS paper, it's proven on the craft. We essentially showed in craft that uh, the construction that we had previously is already publicly verifiable, which is a good property for some constructions. <coughs> so, uh, what you can do here is, so if you have this trapdoor for the RSA group, uh, if you are the one that created the group, you can create the group and uh, get the trapdoor, right? And uh, you can still get random elements, but uh, here you, you can ask for squares and get the, the answers as fast as you want. Essentially, you can do any group operations very fast. So you don't have to wait for the next thing. So let, let's go for all of time lock puzzles. Uh, so they won't use this new instance of uh, 
the heaviest kind of assumption for each time lock puzzle. And then you have uh, two random, two hash functions that are modeled as what's called a restricted programmable and observable global random oracle. That's a paper by, that comes from a paper from Kamini Sharo at Eurocrypt 2018. So you can, so if you want to create a time lock puzzle with a message M, and that should take T steps to solve, what do you do? You first create the, the RSA group and get the trapdoor. Then you get a random element and uh, you can instantaneously compute the solution using the trapdoor. And then you compute hash of the representation, the handle that you have for the initial element and the final element concatenated. And then you pick this result concatenate with the trap door and the message and uh, compute the hash again. And then uh, your time lock puzzle will consist of the description of the initial element, the number of steps that you need to solve the time lock puzzle, and two tags. The first tag is the first hash shared with the message and the trap door, and the second uh, tag is just the result of the second hash. And if you wanna, if you're a normal part and wanna solve uh, the time lock puzzle, what do you need to do? You need to sequentially compute uh, the final element one step at a time. Then when you get this final element, you can compute the first hash and show it with the tag to recover the message and the trap door. And then you can check the second hash. And, uh, and then when you get the trap door and the message, you can check that the uh, the final element was indeed the proper one by using the trapdoor because now you know the trapdoor and you output the message if all checks are fine. And for the public verification, uh, you essentially, if you wanna review to anyone that you have, that a solution of uh, your, the uh, time lock puzzle that you created or that someone forwarded to you the solution, is aim in, in the trapdoor, you can just give this information to that part and then uh, it can, uh, using the trapdoor, it can compute the element very fast and uh, just repeat this steps two and three of, from above to solve that. And the thing here is that, uh, so when you do the security analysis, uh, since uh, this is a restricted programmable random oracle, you can program the random oracle on uh, random inputs that were not created by anyone before, not even the, uh, the environment, because the environment has access to the random oracle as well. But here, I mean, the, 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 the things that you are giving as inputs to the, random, to the hash function are essentially random. So the chances that any other part would have created that specific point before are very small. So you, you normally can uh, program the random oracle to open as you want. So, it's not that hard. I mean, there is a, there are a lot of techni technical details, but it's not very hard to do the proof. So now let me quickly move to secure multi-part computation uh, to quickly give a high level idea of uh, all the results. So secure multi-part computation, you have multiple parts and they, uh, for instance, Alice, Bob and Charlie, and uh, each of them have an input ABC, and they want to compute a uh, uh, function f of abc and they get the output d and they have channels between themselves and they can send secure messages between themselves and so on but the requirements that the protocol for computing the function f should not leak to any part any information what, other than uh, what they can uh, get from their own input and output so for instance, Alice cannot get any information other than what she can infer from A and D, her own input and uh, the output. And uh, typically, uh, MPC protocols, they have two guarantees, the correctness, uh, which says that the protocol compute F in the proper way, and privacy, which is the one that I mentioned before, that, uh, you don't leak any information other than what can be inferred by the input or output of the part. But there are some tricky issues. So fairness. So fairness is a guarantee that if the adversary gets the output, everybody should do, should do get the output as well. But 
Actually, this is impossible. There's a very important result from the 80s by Cleve that shows that if half or more of the parts are dishonest, it's impossible to do fair computation for every, for every functionality, for most of the functionalities, let's say that way. So uh, a lot of protocols, what they do is the following. If the protocol aborts, there is nothing we can do, it aborts. So the adversary get the output, he don't get anything other than uh, what he's supposed to get, but maybe he aborts the protocol and the honest parts don't get the output. But this gives an incentive for the adversary to keep important results to himself. Then, uh, I mean, a notion that was developed in 2014 by Yuval Ishai, Rafael Ostrovsky, and Vasily Zikas, it's the notion of identifiable abort. If some part aborts, everyone will be able to learn who aborted. And they're using some techniques from the very important paper from the H7, the GMW, they can, uh, they can give solutions for that. But I mean, the last few years, uh, there was this new thing, the blockchain. So we, now you have cryptocurrencies and all these kind of things. So people come up with this idea that you can use MPC with punch board, board. So what you do is the following. Use blockchain technology to finance, financially punish any part that aborts the protocol and use the money that you get from these parts to compensate the other parts that uh, didn't get the output. And there are two possibilities. You can punish the adversary if he obtains the output and aborts. There is a bunch of works on that. And for that, you only need the MDC uh, to have identifiable aborts in the output phase. Or you can punish the adversary if he aborts at any time. Even if he aborts, before he gets any results, if you start the protocol and then abort, so he's punished. But uh, for this, you need much heavier machinery from zero knowledge. I mean, the solutions are not practical at all. So, and then we come with this idea of insured MPC last year by the joint work by myself, uh, Kasten Bau and uh, Bernardo David that appear in financial crypto last year. So it's a universal ball composable modular framework for MPC, financially fair, output delivery, and public verification. So you, you get an MPC scheme where the outputs are not given directly to the parts, but they are secret shared. And then you need like some kind of UC public verifiable commitments with homomorphic properties. And you can use these both things to verify the outputs and uh, by adding some uh, standard uh, smart contract that don't need any kind of privacy or anything. The parts can commit and do the verification of uh, the output phase in such a way that uh, if someone uh, aborts, it will be financially punished. So, but now we wanna get at this even stronger notion of output independent abort. So the adversary must decide whether you abort the protocol or not before seeing the output. So why is that good? The adversary don't know at all the output. So he, don't, he, he have executed the whole protocol and uh, he don't got any information at all. And then he, he needs to decide, oh, will I abort the protocol and make the other parts waste time, but essentially I will not gain any output at all as well. Or I will gain the output, but uh, I mean, it's not that I will not gain the output. I gain the output, but I don't know what is the output. So maybe the output is irrelevant and I, I will be financially punished anyway. And uh, he has to make this decision before knowing the output and uh, he cannot pass the output He's still, but uh, I mean, it kind of avoid a lot of uh, rationale strategies for the adversary. So, so essentially what you can do here, it's you modify this previous solution so that less messages of the protocol are same inside of a uh, time lock puzzle, essentially. So the adversary must send it, its time lock puzzle before enough time has passed to be able to open the time lock puzzle of the honest parts. Or otherwise it's already considered an abort. And uh, so he cannot use the output to make the decision of if he is aborting or not. 
So this has applications like in fair coin tossing and randomness becomes a better MPC with financial incentives, so on and so on. So what we do here, it's essentially we follow the, the same style of uh, insured MPC. You have MPC with secret share outputs, but now you have a UC public verifiable homomorph commitments with delayed opening. So you can, you can actually say, I'm opening something, but you only get the result of the opening after some time. And uh, this is done with the time lock poses. So what we show in TARD is that uh, if you pick like a time lock puzzles and delayed secure message uh, channels, and uh, you can modify the previous uh, UC public verifiable of commitment scheme that appeared in Asia Crypt 19 by myself, uh, Nacio Cascudo, Ivan Danga, Bernardo Davi, Nico Dotling, and uh, Irene Giacomelli. You can add this delayed opening, and then you can use this uh, to get a two part computation with output independent abort. And then uh, if you look, uh, we have some extensions of that in craft, which stands to MPC and number of parts, and actually improves the efficiency. So you, you don't need all the homomorphism uh, by using other techniques. And you can, of course, combine this with his smart contracts to obtain MPC with punishable output independent aborts. So how you can get, uh, I'm almost finished, uh, just how you can get efficient randomness beacons from uh, publicly verifiable time lock puzzles. So you can get a Rundau style beacon that's provable, provably unbiasable. So informally it works as follows. So it's like a coin tossing protocol. So every part picks some runners RA and puts it inside a time lock puzzle that can be solved after some time. But this time that takes uh, for the time lock puzzle to be solved should be larger than the time of, uh, the, of the delay of some broadcast channel. So you wait until the upper limit of the broadcast delay and then the pass review the solution of the time lock puzzle and wait for the other pass to do the same. Any part that don't uh, broadcast the time lock puzzle by that time are just ignored. And if a part don't reveal the, uh, the input to the time lock puzzle, the other part will just brute force the time lock puzzle to recover. And uh, to get the final randomness, you just show all the, the random values. As long as one of uh, the parts that contribute to the solution is honest, this is a safe solution. So, so and of course, you can do the parts, uh, make a financial deposit to participate. And uh, if they try to get in the way of the protocol execution, they will be punished. So in this kind of solution, like if, if nothing goes wrong, if everybody acts properly, honestly, this can be very efficient because uh, you can, instead of brute force the time lock puzzles, you can just every part opens it on the time lock puzzle after the broadcasts are done. And everyone can verify by the public verifiability of the time lock puzzles. So we, no one can introduce any bias and so on. But of course, you, you need to know like the relation between the time lock puzzle delay and the, the communication delays. And, uh, I mean, you, you have to have good estimates for that. I mean, th this is the case in general for time lock based or time lock uh, puzzle based or VDF based solutions. And of course, uh, there is this big problem that people are still trying to figure out uh, exactly it's like, we don't have a complete understand of uh, how long uh, it takes to solve time lock puzzles or VDFs. I mean, people are doing a lot of experiments with uh, specialized hardware, whatever, to see what are the, the, the precise line limits of that. So what we also have in craft is you, we generalize uh, the construction of time lock puzzles from TADS so that you can combine uh, a lot of standalone uh, time lock puzzles into a CCQ version. Uh, we also have a UCCQ VDF construction from uh, standalone VDFs plus a global round oracle. And it's actually necessary to have a programmable round oracle in that case as well. 
And we have some formal proof of the flow called uh, VDF beacon, uh, which is exactly like in optimistic terms, it's worse than the solution that I briefly mentioned before. I mean, future directions, uh, we want to do some UC compiler for partial fairness and uh, output independent bots from uh, generic functionals and uh, get some homomorphism uh, properties into these UC secure time lock poses and VDFs that can be useful for some applications. And of course, uh, apply this kind of concepts to time sensitive transactions on cryptocurrencies and time bounds of uh, blockchain protocols. Yeah, thank you. Oh, thank you very There's much. Some questions that I didn't get. Sorry. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, it's, it's just like people. Uh, 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 thank you message. very much for the talk. I think we can take a quick question if anyone has any questions. We are a bit over time. Does anyone have any questions? <coughs> Uh, let me just quickly ask, so there was this second hash function in this TLP. Is it required for the proof or uh, it I mean, to serve so, a lot of purpose? I mean, you, you need, uh, I mean, so essentially you need the second hash function to kind of hide the, the trapdoor and the, the message, right? Use the first, I mean, you use the first hash function to just hash like the representation of the initial and the final element. And mm -hmm. then, uh, I mean, then you do the, sorry, you need, you need that to verify the overall solution. The first one you need for, ah, yeah. for verification. Sorry. sorry. <laughs> yeah, first one is for hiding. Yeah, and the second okay. one you need for checking purposes, just to see if, if the show and everything is fine, because then you, you restrict the space of, of what can be done by the adversary, so the simulation can go through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see. All right. Um, then thank you again, Rafael, and thank you everyone for tuning in. And yeah. thank, thank you, you guys. See you all in the next seminar. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you, Rafael. Bye. Bye.